What's up? This is David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital, and you're listening to The Long Game. In this episode, I chat with David Mausoff, founder of Apex Growth, a boutique growth strategy and marketing consultancy that works with enterprise companies you've heard before, like Meta, Amazon, Shopify, and TransUnion. Prior to starting Apex, David was vice president of user acquisition at Disney and ran growth marketing at Lyft. In this conversation, we talk about leaving a tech world to start an agency, which you don't hear of very often, and how to close big deals through executive buy-in. We have a little section where we rant a little bit about marketing attribution and the downsides of being too data-driven. And he also shares one of his most embarrassing experiences founding a business. I think you're going to learn a lot. Here's my conversation with David Mausoff. David, welcome to The Long Game. Thanks, thanks, David. Appreciate you having me on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for making the time. So you are co-founder of Apex Growth. Um, mm-hmm. And before that, you were at Disney, Lyft, Hotwire, just to name a couple companies. If you were to reflect on that journey, tell us about the key milestones that got you here uh, to building Apex. Yeah, um, the, the spiel... I always going to give is I'm a data analyst that got tricked into doing marketing. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you go actually way back, I want to become a data scientist. I didn't know there actually wasn't called a data scientist. I thought it was just someone who was a data analyst who was doing R uh, or Python um, <laughs> at the time. And so I actually was originally learning that and um, how I originally reached out to me. And they're like, you know, we really like that you understand data. And we're looking for people that don't have any marketing backgrounds and can just solve for things using data. And I was like, cool, sounds great. And um, so I, that was, was that in a marketing role or was, they just put, a, put you where you, where they needed you? It was a marketing role. I actually applied for a data role. I was like, I was like, and they're like, no, we, you should do marketing. And I was like, I know nothing about marketing. I just know how to like analyze data and run queries and stuff. And they're like, that's fine. That's totally great. And their the whole interview process is interesting because it was just looking at spreadsheets and uh, trying to interpret the data. And I was like, well, there's this pattern that's happening here. And lo and behold, if you're really good at analyzing data, it also is like comes in handy for uh, performance-based marketing as well, too. And so kind of cut my teeth doing marketing at Expedia Hotwire and did that for a couple of years. Met some great friends that are still uh, mentors now. and heard about this company called Lyft, um, which is funny at the time because I, I applied to both Uber and Lyft and all my mentors at, um, you know, at Expedia were like, you know, don't go join Lyft. They have a pink mustache on them. Uh, my parents are like, uh, I'm not sure this company is going to like <laughs> revive and be around. I'm not sure this is the smartest idea. Like you're leaving Expedia to go to like this small little company, which is like 70 people at the time. Um, I like the people at, at Lyft better. They're like a bit friendlier than Uber. So I turned on the Uber Interesting. and went to Lyft. Uh, funny little backstory. So I could have ended up the opposite way at Uber. Um, and funny enough, actually, my best friend ended up being my counterpart at Uber. So there was like a couple of years <laughs> where him and I would like be hanging out here in SF. And like, we couldn't basically say anything about work at all because it was like we we're competing head to head with each other. Um, was yeah. that weird? <laughs> it's it's a very weird it, it's a very weird phenomenon, but it's also I feel like a very SF phenomenon as well too, where it's like okay. you end up being like at the same competitor. Um, we're we're like we both left many years ago, so it's like we're all well cool now. Um, and I like to say that Lyft is where I got a bunch of gray hairs. Um, <laughs> it's you know crazy experience, right? I think. The biggest thing it kind of taught me was learning just to be really scrappy and um, not listen to what's in your job description, but just getting the job done right. Um, Expedia was like everything was like organized and there was an org structure and there's like processes and plans, right? And I remember my first day, um, my boss, Adam Fishman, I was like, so, hey, like I had like a five minute orientation, like here's your laptop. And they're like, hey, so what do you uh like what am I supposed to be doing? And he's like, Yeah, just figure out how to grow the company. 
<laughs> Here's some spreadsheets. <laughs> not even that. Just like or not it, even. It's like five minutes. Of like yeah, I forgot to grow the company. <laughs> Let me know if you need anything. And then he just like <laughs> ran off. And I was like, oh, fuck. So you know, I I like to say like it was like a great like trial by fire experience. Um, also like a lot of late nights of like sleeping underneath my desk on Saturdays, which don't recommend to anyone. Wow. Um, so did that for four years. You know, ended up building out a team and got tricked into going to Los Angeles and uh, working at Fox, uh, then Disney, um, running growth product and marketing. And that was a great experience, I would say. But, um, you know, I kind of noticed this pattern of I was going from like company to company. And it was kind of like this same pattern. And you probably noticed this yourself. It was like, you know, join the company, analyze what's going on, build a team. And then two and a half years, three years later, depending on, you know, maybe four years, depending on your equity, uh, you leave the company, go repeat the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. And after a while, like, I don't know if you know the definition of insanity, but it's basically doing the same. <laughs> one of the, per, one of the signs is doing the same thing over and over again. And I was like, am I insane right now? I'm just doing basically the same thing over and over again for maybe a slightly inflated title and like slightly different company. And then I was like, you know, I should probably try to do something else than do this. So, um, I was like, I. I'm getting all these like job offers. Maybe I should just go create a, an agency and just do this and figure out how to do this once and scale this uh, rather than just going and join a new company every like two or three years and drive myself slowly insane. And so, so that's, that's interesting. Were the challenges like that similar where it wasn't interesting or as like interesting enough for you to be like, oh yeah, this I'll stay here for a little bit longer. I, you know what I think? Like, maybe this is just the way that my brain works but i've always been like a very like systems thinker so like i always like i'm like trying to figure out what is like the commonality or the process of like where people think and i was just noticing like yeah there were like slightly different problems right but like the way that you know fun- fundamentally there was like different there was a process that i took right building the team building the processes building the planning and it was kind of consistent and maybe the the plans that we did were slightly different but it's like fundamentally how do you get to how do you design good creative how do you design mm-hmm. good plans how do you prioritize bets how do you hire like good people um a lot of those things were like kind of the same things and also too what i i noticed was you know when i was starting to like run larger teams a lot of what I was doing, I felt like was being a therapist to other executives. <laughs> yeah. so I, like, I, I like, can relate. <laughs> half my job was like, yeah, just being like a, a therapist and be like, yeah, you know, this is okay. It's okay to feel worried about this stuff. It's okay that the growth is slowing down. Like these are all normal things. And it's like, uh, they're like, yeah, great, cool. I feel so much better now, David. And, you know, I do these therapy sessions. It felt like, you know, every two weeks. And afterwards, they'd always feel so much better. And I was like, huh. And so I was just kind of noticing these patterns over and over again. And I was like, it's like, you know, just slightly different people. Um, and I was like, huh. I was like, well, there's all these power patterns happening over and over again. Can I just systemize this? Because no one's really talking about this. Everyone's talking about like the tactics. Yeah. Like, talking yes. About <laughs> things. And I was like, why is no one talking about like the high level? And like, and I was like, well, pr- probably pro- partially it's like there's not a lot of people on the, on the leadership level that are doing this and seeing these patterns. Um, and so I was like, huh, I should probably just figure out how to solve this problem. And I, yeah. I, I, I like to solve problems that are like tough problems. And so that's how I kind of went down that pathway. Yeah. You said just now that there's a lot of focus on the tactics and not enough on the high level. Mm-hmm. Maybe for the listeners, what do you mean by high level? Like, can you dissect that? Yeah. So I feel like if you look at my career, like the first couple of years were really figuring out like the the tactical hard skills, right? Like how do you optimize like Facebook or how do you uh, write a creative brief or how do you, you know, how do you learn everything in it, about it, right? And like, I was probably like drinking from a fire hose and reading every single article and talking to every single person and looking at every single document, right? And at some point I kind of like hit this like wall where I had learned everything. <laughs> or I felt like I learned everything. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm not an SEO expert. I'm not an SEO expert. Um, there's a lot of people that are way smarter than me at product growth, right? I'm not the best uh, at Python anymore. 
they're better than me at Python now these this point. But I was like, okay, like me learning the incremental skill isn't gonna like change the directory. And uh it was one of my bosses, Run McCavi, that really kind of taught me about soft skills. Like, how do you did you say Ronnie Kohavi? R- Run McCavi. Oh, okay. I was, yeah, I was very similar. Okay. <laughs> uh it, it, Israeli Israeli guy uh was in the IDF, super blunt, very, very like direct person. And I, I learned a lot from Run, and he's he's still like a really good um friend and mentor of mine uh, about how do you how do you think about like planning? How do you motivate people? How do you convince executives? How do you like all the all these things that like they just don't like teach you in school or they don't teach you in most jobs and most bosses don't teach you at all? Um and how do you like convince someone to give you like $10 million or sort of like all, all these yeah. like aspects like this, or um how do you push a company to be more aggressive? And um it was just like also things like i were there wasn't a clear framework i would google things online and there wasn't really it was like very generic advice or people that just didn't have the experience and so like that was really invaluable like learning from people like ron or my boss rick at um at uh, disney who was president there is like they they were just like teaching me things that like i never was getting to learn from anyone else and it was just like this tribal knowledge that was kind of like living in their head, right? That they actually never had written down. And that honestly was so much more impactful to my career because like once I had learned all the tactical skills, right? Then it's like, how do I talk to the CEO of Univision, for example, and yeah. convince them that his entire marketing strategy is wrong? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do I how do I do that in like 30 minutes? Yeah. And make them feel like like Without, I know talking about yeah. Right. without them getting defensive as well like there's a certain skill to all of that right and you also have to be like blunt and you also have to be like like uh short and what you say as well too and you can't be too wordy it's like there's all these like little nuances right and just like observing folks like run or rick or um other mentors i've had on that le- senior leadership level i was like oh my god there's so much here that um allows them to be effective and if more people understood this or got exposed to this um there'd be a lot more successful like marketing or growth leaders out there yeah so, um, that that's kind of to add a little bit more context or <laughs> expand on what what i just said yeah i wonder is, is it fair i know this might be oversimplifying it is it fair to boil all that down to a communication as a leader of an organization yeah, I think it. I think communications. It, it's communication, right? It's also, um, it's also like your behavior as well too. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 communication, attitude, behavior, right? Those are the the key aspects, right? Um, like an example of that is one of the things that Ren had told me one time is, um. He's like, one of the goals that I do in meetings is he's like, I just shut up. And he's like, I don't talk at all in meetings. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he's like, I'll be sitting in a meeting of like 30 people. And he's like, there's this phenomenon. And he was explaining this. He's like, there's a phenomenon like that once the highest paid person in the room talks, everyone changes how they're going to talk to adapt to whatever the highest paid person is saying in the room. And he's like, so I have to purposely not talk and not comment to just see how people are organically going to like communicate and how they organically think and observe. And he's like, and then I wait until the very end of the meeting and I say only like two sentences and that's it. And my whole goal is just to summarize everything I've heard hearing in that like one hour meeting and summarize it in two sentences to like make it really clear like what direction they need to go right. And so, like, just getting to hear, like, the thinking process behind that and his behaviors and how he acted, right? And then how people also react to how he how he reacts as well, too. It's like, yeah, it's like we hear about IQ, but it's like the emotional intelligence is also super important, I realized, um, to being, like, a successful leader and, like, 
actually like leading large organizations. Yeah, you're, you're getting my my brain going because I'm triangulating on different things I've seen and observed, like observing executives at HubSpot doing that. And I'm reading a book called Multipliers where they talk about that exact thing, like leaders need to shut up and just let their team talk. Um, and now this is like a third data point of you also observing and learning that same thing. So now I'm, I'm seeing a pattern here of behaviors to learn. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and there's obviously many more examples from there. Yeah. You mentioned you were tricked to moving to LA. How did that happen? <laughs> um, well, you know, after I left Lyft, I, this is maybe like a little bit of a personal story. Um, I think this is pretty common. A lot of folks who've done the startup grind, you kind of get burned out after a while. Mm -hmm. um, after four years at Lyft, I was also a little bit burnt out too. And so um, I actually quit without a job lined up and I went to Berlin um germany for nice. months and also went to switzerland and a few other places um and i really fell in love with berlin at the time i was like yeah this is a great place you know uh they have good coffee they have good cheesecake there and uh you can go hang out and get two dollar champagnes um <laughs> so that you know just kind of gives you like a little glimpse and you know i was talking to all these different companies at the time and one that had reached out was you know fox and um my my mentor and friend rick uh phillips was there and i was like you know i don't want to i don't go i don't go to los angeles you know a bunch of douchebags there and <laughs> and entertainment and you know, a bunch of cars to us the opposite um but i really like the people they're really they're really nice people i mean rick is a really good guy and um and i was like all right i'm gonna move to los angeles and I'll do this for two years and then i'm out and um I, I was, you know, recently single after I left Lyft as well, too. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, as this stuff usually happens, I end up meeting my now wife <laughs> in Los Angeles. Of course. Like, I'm not moving to Berlin. So the the Berlin dream kind of got, got squashed. And <laughs> um, she ended up, you know, we ended up diving to Los Angeles more and staying there and uh, I got to see some other sides of Los Angeles than just the the West Ho Hollywood public facing side that a lot of folks think of, yeah. uh, or Hollywood. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I also you know had a few friends that moved from San Francisco who were artists um, down to Los Angeles, um, and so that also kind of helped out as well too. So yeah, I, I like to say that a lot of my friends and and Rick and other folks kind of convinced me to got down Los Angeles and end up staying in Los Angeles lo longer than I expected. To, uh, yeah, it's like you got ambushed with a bunch of reasons to move to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a per period of my life where it made sense to live in, live in LA. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So um, I want to get to Apex Growth. There, or at least I haven't met a lot of people in tech who decide to leave tech and go build an agency. I'm also one of those folks and people are very confused about it. Yeah. What led you to make that decision? You had mentioned seeing these patterns and packaging up before, but an agency is a very different business from, you know, tech. You know, it, I, I, I kind of learned this in hindsight, but it's always good when people pay you to do stuff before you formalize a business model. Um, so what actually originally happened was I was kind of moonlighting uh, actually, I got reached out to um, back when I was at Fox, and people were like, "Yeah, you know, we'll pay you ten thousand dollars to talk to us like a couple hours a week." Um, I'd have to do it in the evening or do it on Saturday and Sunday during my free time. So that was, you know, my girlfriend wasn't well, always the happiest about that piece. Um, and you know, we just started kind of getting reached out by more folks, and I was like, "Okay, well." Yeah, we just keep on getting asked to do more and more of this stuff. And, you know, we'd raise our prices and mm -hmm. it was just my business partner, Dave and I, who were kind of doing this. And I'm like, okay, well, there kind of came this point where it's like, okay, well, there was this option of, you know, taking on a more senior level role at uh, Disney or Scopely or going and doing this full time. And we're like, well, you know, if we go do this full time, like, is this something that we're actually excited about doing? Like, do we think there's an opportunity here? And I was like, yeah, I, th I think there actually, I think there actually is. And I don't want to 
again, it's like, I don't want to just take like a CMO role at DoorDash or, you know, whatever the, the next company is. And I, uh, I bit the bullet and I was like, Hey, the worst that's going to happen is I do this for a year and it ends up failing and I can always go back. So, um, I always kind of look at like, what's the, what's the opportunity cost or what's the downside risk. And again, there, there's always people hiring for like VPs of growth or CMOs or things like that. So it's not like they're not creating more jobs. Um, so I wasn't worried about going and trying and doing this and, um, ended up taking like a massive pay cut at first, you know, I think I went down to like yeah. 120 K, which, you know, much higher beforehand <laughs> as this disease. As I, I feel that pain. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thankfully we've, we've gotten back up to some good numbers. So I'm a little bit happier now. Um, but I, you know, I'd say the first 12 months were just kind of when we did it full time was just kind of figuring out, you know, our positioning and what the actual opportunity was. And even though like we had been doing this for a while, I kind of learned that there was kind of this missing piece, which was um, most agencies that we were dealing with, and I think this is why they get a bad rap, end up hiring folks who were like 25 years old or 22 or, you know, just fresh out of college. Mm -hmm. And then they're kind of like competing in these RFPs um, to try to like, you know, win businesses. And it's like this kind of brutal slog and margins game. And I was like, I don't, I'm not going to do that. It's like, I was like, I'm not going to do RPs and I'm not going to, I was like, I want to hire the best people. <laughs> and that means it's probably gonna need, not going to be like cheap to, to work with us, but that's fine. And I was like, also too, I like, I want to do the strategy side as well too. Cause it's like, I, I feel like that was kind of the thing I was noticing too, is a lot of times people would come to us and they would already like in their mind, know what their problem was or like how to solve it. Like, oh, we just need to like do Facebook or we need to, you know, you know, optimize our creative, whatever it was. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I found is a lot of times they're wrong. <laughs> like they were completely wrong. And the things actually they were looking for help with, with weren't the things that actually needed help with. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually happened with like one company. And I was like, Hey, just let me like talk to your team for like two months and just interview everyone and just analyze everything and I'll just do it for free. And uh, I ended up talking to them. I realized actually you have a organizational design issue. The way that you plan your like financial plan is also incorrect as well too. And actually your whole monetization onboarding is like the real issue. So it's like, I know that you said Facebook was an issue, but actually all these other issues are like, it's like kind of like an iceberg on us. It's like, mm -hmm. they saw like Facebook performance is bad. But there's actually all these underlying root cause issues that were driving that issue. And so it's like, I was able to go back to them and have this like seven page document. Like, hey, here's all the reasons. Here's what your team's saying. Here's like the root cause issues. And this is why you shouldn't focus on this. And you should actually go focus on these issues instead. Um, and so we, you know, we spent like 18 months with them kind of solving those issues and lo and behold once we solve those issues suddenly facebook performance is doing great right mm -hmm. versus like trying to like hit your head against the wall and try to solve this channel problem and so the thing i enjoy the most is like actually figuring out like what is the real issue because most people are really bad at diagnosing what the real issue is so yeah so what does that engagement look like so it sounds like that i'll, cons I'll call that a sales process where you're meeting with all the different stakeholders and learning about what's going on. But those 18 months, what does it look like? Is it, mm -hmm. is it meeting with them a couple of times a week and helping them problem solve like other yeah. deliverables? I'm trying to understand because I know yeah. Apex growth, you all pitch yourself very differently from how other agencies pitch themselves. Like mm -hmm. the differentiation is there. Um, I'm curious what it looks like in practice. Yeah. So an example for one of our clients, um, large uh, e-commerce company that you get used before um with them it did start out with uh, basically management consulting for the first three to four months and that looked like looking at their org design looking at how they basically did um modeling their growth program looking at how they designed incentives for their team and we kind of solved a lot of those issues and it was kind of working myself or my co-founder who's kind of working with them and then we kind of get to a point where 
we solve a lot of these like high level issues and then we can start getting to like the executional layer and so most people will just jump into the executional layer and just try to start, start like solving things right um but again if you haven't solved like the actual strategy issues then you're kind of like executing against a bad strategy and so once we solve that then it's starting to execute and that's when we bring in team our team and so it could be you know bringing engineers or designers or marketers or program managers depending on like what the scope is and usually what happens then is you know we're working on a set of set of things so it could be working for example like on facebook could be working on conversion rate optimization um could be rebuilding their like uh, marketing flow so we're kind of working on those issues and almost th this is like the default pattern i've kind of noticed is they almost always have an in-house team like shopify is one of our client i think they have like yeah. 300 employees on their growth team right now and yeah usually what happens is there's some problem that no one wants to solve for <laughs> or like they it's usually like the hard unsexy problem that no one wants to touch right problem. and then like we end up like solving for it you know depending on how complex it is and then they decide they want to go hire someone full-time for that cool right so we're kind of working yourself out of a job and then there's magically like five other problems that they need to solve for and then the, like the almost default uh response that we get is like okay like just don't get used to like working with us because like we're gonna go like replace you guys it's like okay cool <laughs> and it's like you know you know 18 months or two years later like it's like the clients are still working with us right so it's like it never happens but you know we almost never like sign annual contracts we almost always just sign month month contracts just because we found like if we do really good work um there's never like a shortage of problems and the companies never need to like stop growing um you know you're always going to have like higher targets and so it ends up being this forcing function where there's like new problems that are always solving for um the other component too is it's really important to us to have like an executive stakeholder um like we we actually require that now we don't work with companies unless there's like an executive stakeholder we won't work with like junior people we won't work with mid-level people because a lot of problems do require having the board of directors or the CEO, or the co-founder involved. And if they're not willing to go work with us, then chances are they don't really um, think it's a serious problem. And so um, we charge a lot of money and we also require an executive stakeholder and it ends up filtering out the clients for the people that actually like really, uh, really are willing to actually make major changes to the business. Yeah. When you say executive stakeholder, is that like minimum VP or someone from the C-suite always? Minimum VP um, can be a C-suite too, depending on like the size of the company. Yeah. I, I think what's interesting and funny enough, we were talking about this earlier on as we were building our agency, we were saying we're, we're in a content SEO space, which is pretty commoditized. And so people come to expect a certain thing. And we realized that, hey, how are these big four consulting firms charging millions of dollars to do these projects that, I mean, they just put fresh out of college uh, employees yeah. on. Like, yeah. How come there isn't anything like that in the marketing agency world? And it's, a, it's an aspirational view of it, but I think I read somewhere on your website, maybe like there's McKinsey and then just like, you guys are trying to be more of that management consulting approach to, to growth. So how does, how have, or, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this, but I imagine when people talk to you, they have a certain expectation of what you do mm -hmm. and you might need to overcome that barrier of the wrong expectations and reframe how you can help them. Yep. Can you tell tell us about that and the types of conversations you need to have to, to work through that? Um, yeah, so like a, a lot of times, I'll, I'll give you an example. This is a recent one. Um, a COO came to us and a lot of times what i realized is people that are on a very same level they know something's wrong too but they don't actually know how to describe what the issue is so this person you know recently took over marketing and was responsible for company growth and company growth was slowing down and like hey i just feel like the company the market i feel like the company marketing team's not doing well and i just feel like things aren't like optimized <laughs> and so it's like this it's a very like nebulous 
like gray area like question and so what they're looking for really is they don't have a lot of free time and so they don't have like time to like really go investigate this like issue because they're trying to do everything else mm -hmm. and so part of the reason that we do like those audits and we spend so much time with the team and understanding what the actual request problem is is because if we can go back to them and help them get clarity around that and also get the board of directors or other folks on it then you actually get large organizational change that's also where larger budgets are this is actually and the reason we say the mckinsey of growth because that's really similar to what they do too right it's like you know yes they bring in like the 22 year olds uh or interns who are in, in college right but they have a framework in place but they have that executive stakeholder that's talking to the executives mm -hmm. and actually figure out what is the real issues at the company and getting agreement there and that's a lot of times also things that they know in the back of their head and you're kind of like telling them things they already know right and giving them permission to like move forward on these ideas right but by getting that alignment that's how mckinsey you know <laughs> does 11 billion dollars in revenue which is insane uh, I, I didn't realize it was like that huge, right? Is because you're, like, you're getting that alignment. My my mom used to be um, uh, exec. She used to be president for Europe as a kid, mm -hmm. and I asked her. I was like, "How much did um, I think they? I think they were using McKinsey or Bain, and I think she said that they were charging just for of Europe like fourteen point six million dollars per like quarter or something insane like that, right? It was like in, in like wow. a ridiculous amount of money, right? Uh, keep in mind, this is probably like you know 10, 12 years ago at this point. Um, but it kind of just gives you a sense. It's like, you know, when you when you're dealing with like higher and higher level people, the available budget also increases and your ability to solve a wider set of problems increases too. Um, but the definition of the problem also becomes more opaque. You know, if you, if you just go down to like a lower part of the team, then it's, hey, we need to solve for Facebook, right? And so they're going to have a budget for Facebook and they're going to have like a, a budget for agencies. If you go all the way up to the executive, it's like, yeah, they have hundreds of millions of dollars potentially to go spend around, but they need to feel really confident about what the problem is and what the solution is or the approach, right? Um, so I just talked a lot, but like it, it, it's not obvious until you've been like talking to a lot of these executives on a consistent basis. Yeah, and the, the thing that's fascinating to me is you are coming in as an external consultant, and I don't know how these big four consulting firms come in, build that trust with stakeholders, mm -hmm. affect change. And I imagine it doesn't happen overnight. You don't just sign a contract and you're in and making changes immediately. I imagine a lot of that trust is built during the sales process maybe over many years and i'm wondering like how do you even build those connections i imagine like personal brand might come from it somehow um, yeah. you mentioned that people were reaching out with job offers how does that all play into this yeah so the, here's what i've kind of noticed like the patterns one is like you, you have to have had been in an executive role to give you that basically social proof right that's kind of the starting point um the second piece is people that you worked with in the past who've been in senior level roles right um third and this is kind of more on the personal branding side is like going to conferences where there's other executives like invite only ones um there's actually an event called traction conference that i've spoken at a bunch of times mm -hmm. right um and tends to be like you know ceo of intercom or like other people like that and so you end up interacting with them there's also like private Slack groups that you get invited to as well, too, where it's like these folks and they're kind of you're kind of talking like in a very small group of like 100 people and just trading notes. Um, and then the other component is like those job interviews. So it's like um, making those introductions, keeping those relationships like a lot of people see like job interviews as like I need a job, but like it's also a way to also build in roads to people and get to know them like, hey maybe i'm not the right fit for you and this is maybe a crazy thing but a lot of times like if i'm not the right fit i'll actually try to find someone from my network who is the fit for them and introduce them and i've actually like i think i should charge money for this but i've gotten like three people <laughs> through my friends placed 
for jobs that they originally approached me for and said I'm not the right fit and I ended up bringing them in and they yeah, take a take a percent commission of that paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um th- that's kind of the consistent. And then this is very similar like to McKinsey too. A lot of it ends up being um referral word of mouth, right? So like once you have yeah. these connections, then they go refer you to other business as well too. Or when they change jobs, they like bring you into the next company as well too. Um now the other component of that too is you know again a lot of these folks don't have a lot of time at the c level right so they're not going to chances are they're not going to comment or share or like your linkedin content um they're not going to read a 20 page document right uh that you post right um they're not googling things as well too so it's like to actually like get in front of these audiences you have to like optimize for a short attention span and you have to optimize for like FaceTime or, you know, being invited to like a event or like a private Slack group and getting exposed that way. All right. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I know we're, we're spending a lot of time on the high level stuff right now, because you kind of prompted that early on and that, that piqued my interest. Yeah. I know that you mentioned, um, people tend to focus a little bit too much on the tactics and there are a couple of tactical things I did want to ask you about, like sure. attribution, attribution is <laughs> a hot topic right now. Um, <laughs> it comes up all the time in conversations. Yeah. Um, it's one of the hardest conversations when it, when it comes to like SEO and content because of some of these long sales cycles, but talk to me about attribution. Like, I think a lot of us agree companies spend too much time and money on it. What, what should they be doing instead? Yeah, I, I think, uh, Okay, so here, here's some real talk. Um, there's a whole yeah. industry out there that's trying to tell you, well, there's a whole b- number of consultants out there that are going to charge you a bunch of money to try to tell you that they have data-powered attribution or that they have you know, media mix modeling or blah, 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 right? I honestly think 95% of it's useless. And... <laughs> I, I'm saying this as like a former data analyst and as someone who's built my own attribution models and gotten a lot of great hairs from it as well, too. The reason why is this, okay? Every one of these models, it doesn't matter if fucking Google or whoever does this, it just tells you one way of looking at the world or how to assign credit. But there's actually a more important question. And I think what people misunderstand is they think that attribution is telling you how you should value people, right? And so they make this flawed mistake of like, I'm moving from last touch to multi-touch. And they mm-hmm. think that's getting them a better answer, but it's actually not because fundamentally the real question is what's actually what's actually driving value? Like is like would this would this ad, would this referral, would this email actually have an impact? If I didn't send it, like, did it actually get people to like buy more? And most tools won't ask you answer that question because the actual process of getting incrementality data can vary based on the channel or the tactic that you're using. And it takes a lot of work. Like, and, and there's no, like, I know there's like some tools like incremental out there that, you know, say that they do it like in an automated fashion. And everything I've seen is it's it's not true. There's very, yeah, there, the actual work of measuring incrementality rate by channel is a hard slog, and it's very analytics intensive, and you have to do it on a consistent basis. And that's the only way to really understand how you should be assigning credit to your marketing and what's actually driving value. There's no automated tool to do it that I that I know right, and I know a lot of really smart folks. No one that has shown me a tool that's in automated fashion right and it's not sexy it's a lot of work it sometimes costs money and people want you know easy solutions right people don't want to spend the time to actually build an always on incrementality testing model because well i mean a lot of marketers don't have a lot of extra time so like they want something like out of the box that's going to solve all their issues right they don't want to like get into the messiness of having to like figure out incrementality and how do you assign credit and everything like that, right? They want something yeah. that tells them everything they need to know 
and they can go yeah. go on with their life. We 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 just did another podcast recording yesterday, and we were talking about this idea of how people need to stop going after low hanging fruit because everyone's doing the same thing, and it's very crowded space. People are trying to easy tactics because it's yeah. it's easy, it's low effort. Yeah, but it's really the things that take a lot more effort that are probably going to make the most impact and and differentiate and give you that competitive edge. It sounds like this is one of those things. So, what does it look like to build this always-on incrementality testing framework? So, yeah. I mean, there's uh, <laughs> there's <laughs> I'll, I'll skip the one that we did left because it's not gonna it's it's a simple one. A simpler one is there's a one client where every single quarter for every single channel from referrals to uh, pricing to emails to Facebook ads, Google search ads, we have designed different incrementality testing approaches like Google search, for example, there's no there's, Google doesn't give you a way to do this, right? Because uh, they don't want they don't want you to know this. <laughs> Um, and so we've had to build a different model with our data with the data science team and analytics team, uh, sometimes with the partners to measure this, and it gets done at the same time across different dimensions. So sometimes it's just at the country or channel level. Sometimes it can get even more granular down to the tactic level. So like country channel retargeting versus prospecting, right? And it really is gated based on the sample size and how much how large that is, whether or not it makes sense to. Uh, segment it. And once all that data is collected, then there's basically an error factor applied to the attribution model. So it may say the attribution model that you're getting 100 users, and the error model may, error rate may say that actually you're only getting 50, or actually you might be getting 150, right? So that gets all applied um, in a count of four. And then that data then is used to set what the targets are for that program. Right. Mm -hmm. So, hey, given this, your cost per user has to be this, or your cost per user has to be, you know, based on the 50 users essentially. And then that gets operationalized into all the reporting. So it, it doesn't like a lot of times what happens is people run an incrementality test and they don't have the buy in from the analytics and data science team. And so that data ends up living some presentation and never getting applied to the reporting. Yeah. And it has to get to apply to the same reporting that the executive team is looking at and the finance team is looking at as well too. So there's also this process of like helping the executive team understand incrementality testing, which is, you know, for anyone to how to do it, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work and also getting the finance team to understand it as well too and make sure that it's reflected in the reporting, right? So it's not just like running the test, it's like getting the test structure designed. And even once you run it, then it's getting it into all the reporting across all the teams. And then it's getting the C-suite to understand it. It's getting the finance people to understand it. It's getting the marketers to actually use it to uh, buy against or the product teams to like change how they're running their testing. So it's a lot <laughs> to, to do. Yeah, it, it seems like the hardest part is probably the operationalization of the findings and results because it may be amazing and you may find a big opportunity but if it's not operationalized then it's just gonna go fade away in some random google sheet or slide deck yeah you, you i'd say like nine times out of ten why something fails is not that they haven't actually run incrementality testing before it's that like a marketing manager or like someone mid-level ran it and they just kind of like got lost in the large company shuffle and it just got buried and oftentimes what i hear is from like some c-suite i remember this is really funny we are presenting the results and how we're going to operationalize it and this uh marketing manager said to the well actually the, the executive said like wow this is so amazing and this is great i'm like i can't believe we haven't ever run incrementality testing before and operationalized it and this marketing manager like what the hell like i presented this in the slide like five months ago and she's like oh well uh, i remember i don't remember seeing this <laughs> and that's just a really common pattern that happens mm -hmm. is like someone's like i've already done this and it's like it's not enough just to go do it it's like you have to figure out how to actually operationalize and push things forward which 
you know, you've been at a large company before, you know, it can be a challenge to do that. Yeah, it's it's building a slide deck and then socializing and pitching it to people over and over again until the repetition kicks in and they're like, oh, wait, this is a big opportunity. <laughs> I've been saying that for three months. <laughs> Let's go do this. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> So this this next thing I'm going to say might go counter to what we've been talking about here. It seems like there might have been a tipping point where marketing was data driven and data informed, mm-hmm. and at some point became a little too focused on the data. Like yeah. they they might have I've I call it like data dependent rather than data driven, where yeah. they're not going to make a decision until they have all the data to justify it and feel comfortable and confident in that decision, and at least I'm starting to see this, it seems like there's more of a resurgence of creative brand marketing mm-hmm. and differentiation and performance marketing. So yeah, um, I, I know like you, you spoke about figuring out the right creative and everything, but you've also talked about the data. What are you seeing in like what's happening in marketing right now with data? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to like 2011, it was really hard to like get reporting or it could be challenging. And now you have like, Looker and Tableau, and um, you have tons of like ETL solutions, and you can get cost data, right? So there's no shortage of information, right? But I like to say like there's like dashboard diarrhea or like vomit essentially. <laughs> it is like really common. Thing, <laughs> yeah, is um, I'm actually an information design geek. Um, like there's a guy named Tufty who is yeah. actually one of like the first, you know. Uh, designers um and you know fundamentally really good information design which is what a dashboard or report is right is tells you the information you need to know and tells you a story in the simplest form and you can look at it and even if you know nothing about the subject you can figure it out within like 15 to 30 seconds right that, that that's the goal and that's the framework right and dashboard vomiting which i like to call it is you know you look at a dashboard and someone's had they have 20 different graphs and they have like three tables and you know the solution is always just add another metric add another metric add another graph into here right and you know that ends up failing the task because you know you end up looking at it and you're like what's important and what should i actually be looking at right and really good dashboards simply just tell you really quickly like is this doing good or bad or neutral mm-hmm. and then look at it again and so it's actually figuring out what are the key metrics that you actually care about um but the the other com- other part too that you were kind of referring to is like data dependent is like there's kind of like a paralysis of analysis as well i've noticed with some teams where it's like yeah it's like they don't they refuse to do something unless they have the data back on it. And it's like, you're never going to have, look, you're never going to have a hundred percent of the data. And if you're always waiting for a hundred percent data, um, you're, well, first of all, it's going to be taking a long time and it just, you know, you're also just not, not going to make a lot of like big bets and creative is actually kind of one of those things as well too. It's like, you know, you, you want to know exactly why something's doing well. Um, and I think, you know, you end up getting into situations where people are basically pixel fucking and they're basically like, you know, <laughs> did, you, did you say pixel fucking? Yeah, it's, it's a, <laughs> I've never a, heard of that. a lot of my designer friends will, will joke around and say that, but it's like, you know, it's like, you're making like these like really small tweaks to try to like isolate the impact. Right. Um, and sometimes you need to make big changes to the design based on, you know, based on what you know about your customers, right? And so I would say, like, it's great to know about data. I'm not, I'm, I'm a data analyst. I love looking at data, right? Um, but it's also important to just look at the qualitative piece and understand your cons- your customer and, like, what do they actually resonate with? What do they care about? What are they talking about? And how do you logically like tell a tell a story, right? Like um trying to think of like a, a great example of this. Um you know, here here maybe like a simple example. So back at Marvel Strike Force, when we were creating retargeting ads, 
they basically just took the existing ads that we were using for new users and porting them over and saying come back in the game and Mm -hmm. you know i I remember just sitting back one day i was like what would people actually care about and what would get them to come back in the game and so i was like you know what i really would want to have happen is i'd want to know there's actually some event happening that would actually make you want to come back in the game and it sends me to a custom landing page and that landing page looks exactly like the ad that we just saw and it gave me some credits as well too so it's like this is like whole journey right and i was like there's a bunch of work that's going to be required to go do this but i i think personally me as a player that's what i would actually want to have happen um and lo and behold we went and did that and like all the retargeting was not profitable and all of a sudden when we did that it was like hugely profitable and so what we just did is we created this whole content calendar of like custom like landing pages and custom like ads and it gave you credit and there was like some product requirements and creative team had to do it and there had to be a content calendar and like there was a bunch of like work that had to like go do to make it happen right and it wasn't like these like small iterative changes but Mm -hmm. we as players were like actually this is something that we would actually care about right and so it's maybe like an example like the qualitative side and i i think you know the challenge of like any creative thinking like that is you know, you can build a creative pr- thinking process, but you can't guarantee that it's going to be like a great result like that as well, too. So anyways, I'm, I'm getting a little bit philosophical about creative thinking and, you know, how it's different than like logical, logical based thinking. But anyways. Yeah, it's I mean, we could dig in. I if we had more time, I would love to dig into like that whole process of getting by and then like convincing them it's worth testing when there was no data to prove that would work. But that I think that would make this an even longer conversation. I know we're running out of time. Um, we'll, we'll start wrapping it up, but I did want to ask, I did some digging and I found your YouTube channel. I think there's just one video on yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Tell me about American cannabis. Yeah. So um, I think if you don't have like a startup company that you credit that you're embarrassed or a company that you credit <laughs> that you're embarrassed about, um, you probably haven't been like taking, as, taking enough risk. Um, so this, I think was actually the first like, I guess, company that I tried to create with my friend, uh, Chris Sablas. Um, so him and I, you know, worked together back at Lyft, he was director of data. And, uh, you know, I think weed was like starting to like take off here in California. It was still like uh, medical and soon as we become like uh, legal or you could buy in stores. And so uh, my friend Chris had this like great idea one night and he's like, you know what we need? We need the Marvel Row of <laughs> we need the barber <laughs> of cannabis and i was like yeah some makes makes sense right like you know there's there's marlboro cigarettes to me there's going to be like a marlboro of like cannabis right and like it's going to be very brand oriented um the challenge right is our skill sets in like digital marketing and you can't do any you can't do any marketing like facebook's not going to let you advertise this google's not going to let you advertise this right um the only thing you could actually really do was uh basically have billboards so there's actually i don't know if it's still mm-hmm. like a lot but there was like all these billboards for like dispensaries and like ease and stuff like that right and we're like first problem was like how do we actually go you know create these cigarettes and so we had like research like cigarette making machines industrial ones and they had to like source the weed and stuff like that and you had yeah. to build your own supply chain and all that yeah <laughs> yeah and, and luckily we have great have great partners that love us and stuff like that and so you know not going to say how much but like you know you have a decent amount of weed that you're dealing with and building cigarette cigarettes for right and then you're trying to like sell it <laughs> sell it <laughs> online and we had this thing of 15 minute delivery for the cigarettes oh wow like 10 bucks or something like that right um whole bunch of issues logistically that happened with that um and even but you know like even with that you know i feel like you learn something every single time something fails in that case i kind of learned as okay well first of all stick to the domain that you actually know don't don't go to domains that are like highly regulated um unless you have like ends on the regulatory side uh and also by the way we just we just a terrible market to be in i don't know if you've seen the data but like most companies are like losing hands full i think actually like most of the companies 
like here in California, even are like losing money right now. Um, are you talking like the brick and mortar? Brick and mortar, or... even brick and mortar, even like producers are oh. because the taxes are so high. And basically, there's this big bum rush where everyone is like, oh, I want to like start selling yeah. and stuff like that. And so there's, you know, I think there's probably gonna be some consolidation happening, but it's like at this stage where it's very similar to actually the automotive market where there's actually this wall at Ford of like oh, 500 different automotive brands. Can't believe it. That were like around in like the 20s or 10s when like the Model T first took off. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're kind of like the stage right now, like with the cannabis market where there's just so many different like brands competing for like everything. Like, you know, there's 5,000 different edible brands that you could probably choose from, right? Yep. Not all of them can obviously survive, right? And so there's got to be like some consolidation happening. Um, and a lot of it's very regionalized too. It's like you can buy something in San Francisco, but then you go to like Washington and you can't buy it there. And it's completely different in Colorado as well too. So there's not like a consistent like Starbucks experience. Yeah. And part of it is like, there's not like an incentive, right? Like, you, you know, if you're trying to like go do that, right? Someone could go shut down your bank account, right? So there's not like the desire for like a large company to enter the market. So anyways, a whole yeah, bunch of not yet. Not, that, not that's, yet. Yeah. That's fascinating. I I've experienced that on the consumer end, but I haven't thought about it on the business end. Like there's a new service in uh Boston called Lantern. Mm-hmm. And I remember going on the website and I did all the filters and everything, and it was still five thousand options for edibles. <laughs> and I'm like, how the hell? Let me just pick whatever's on the first page, I guess. Like whatever looks yeah. tasty. Um, yeah. And I'm here in Long Beach, California, just visiting a family. And the stop that I would go, normally go to is closed down. And I've yeah. noticed others have shut down. So yeah, it's very timely that I've now learned <laughs> about what's yeah. going on in the industry from you. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So I know we got a couple minutes here. So we'll we'll wrap up with a couple closing questions. Yeah. And we will we're gonna have to have you on for part two because there's a bunch of things I didn't get to ask you about. Okay. But we'll we'll get into some closing questions here. What's one opinion you have about business that you think people would disagree with? Hmm. What's one opinion I have about business people would disagree with? Um okay. Uh Maybe not everyone's going to disagree with this, but I don't think you need to work. Okay. Put this way. I think there's like, there's times when you're running a business where you have to work crazy hours, right? But I would say if that's like your default way of running the business, even as a startup founder, um, you're fundamentally doing something wrong or you're in the wrong business. Um, and I, I've seen actually a lot of people uh a lot of vcs say like they won't invest in businesses like for stupid stuff if they have like a out of office response or like they aren't working like late nights or things like that or like that they're in indi- they're indicators of like bad entrepreneurs and for me the way i've always kind of thought about this is like if you have to work that much and you have to do that consistently you are either bad at delegating you're bad at focusing on the right things to work on um or yeah i mean you're just a workaholic and you're gonna burn you're gonna burn out as well too right so it's like they're all like negative signs that are indicating that something is wrong and so i i would really be happy if there was less of this i guess like aura especially in the bay area of like you have to work like crazy hours and that's the key success Mm -hmm. and it's like there's tons of data that you know mckinsey and other folks have looked at um that more time does not equal like more success and you know there's actually a point where it's like you know even folks who are working 70 hours a week it's like are you really like are you really being efficient right or are you just trying to yeah. brute force things right so yeah i love it that's i think that's a good reminder for a lot of us who might be defaulting to that every now and then it happens yeah What's one, maybe it's related to what you just said, but what, what, what is one impactful piece of advice that you've been given? Yeah. Um, so actually there's one of my mentors, this guy named Greg Lehrman, who, uh, bootstrapped this company outputs, 
Um, it's basically like a music music DOS system. And he, he's super family oriented and really appreciate like his way of building his business. And one of the things he shared that I felt really found helpful as an entrepreneur as well as other, I've shared with other entrepreneur friends, he's like, you know, your job actually as a founder is to build a machine. And so he's like, what I do is every single year, I take a longer and longer, longer and longer breaks from the company. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what I'm doing then is when I walk away and I go on vacation, I don't check anything. And I basically come back and I see what was bro- broken. And he's like, that basically tells me what's breaking in the machine. And then I try to fix those parts of the machine that are breaking. And he's like, you're like, I'll start off with like two weeks and I took a month and I took three months off. And he's like, every time I do that and I extend that, I can figure out where things are breaking and then just solve for that. And he's like, and it's a very different thinking than a W2 person, like employee-based person, because like you're assigned to a role and you're optimizing, optimizing. Whereas, you know, when you're a business owner, you're actually building the machine and you're trying to be able to design it to walk away. And he says something really important. He's like, no one's going to buy your company if they can't, if you can't walk away from it, right? Because then it's tied to you. But it's like, if you can walk away with it from it and it's a self-sustaining entity and it's going to run itself, then that's actually increasing the value of the company. And by the way, that frees you up to go work on other things as well too. Mm-hmm. And I've shared that with a lot of friends who feel like they, who are entrepreneurs who have like, try to be in every part of the business or feel like they need to be in the weeds. And it's been such a transformational shift in thinking about what I need to be focused on as a leader and like, Hey, why, why do I feel like I need to be involved in this decision? And how do I work myself out of this decision to still get to the right result? And it's like a different way of trying to approach the problem versus like, I'm just going to go into this problem and this problem. And I want to know about this. And I want to know, like I, I was talking to, <laughs> this is insane. I was talking to like a um uh, a CEO and he was like checking the Facebook account and checking the <laughs> Facebook page. And he's like, oh, there's a typo here. And it's like, why the hell are you looking at the Facebook page and looking at the typo? Like, mm-hmm. like, and I I actually yelled at him. I was like, dude, you're being <laughs> you're being a fucking idiot. I'm like, you realize you're being a fucking idiot here. Was this a client? It's a it's a friend, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a friend, but like. I, I we've known each other. I can like be pretty blunt. blunt. I was yeah. like, I like, I was like, you know, because I care about you. Like, you are utterly wasting your time, and you're wasting your team's time too by doing this. And he's like, and I was like, it's free, free advice. By the way, you can you can do it. But it's like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, there is a typo there. I agree with you, but the solution is not to email people about it. It's to figure out why is what systematically is causing that. And by the way. Again, that's not your job to go fix it or go email people about it. Your job is to figure out what's breaking the machine. And um, he kind of got pissed off at me. And then, you know, later it's like, okay, you're probably right. But (laughs) again, I I think that's a really important piece of advice that a lot of us as entrepreneurs aren't really given. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope he paid you like $10,000 for that piece of advice. <laughs> no, that's a great reminder. All right. So what what's one book you'd recommend more people read? Um one book I've been really liking a lot. It's called uh The Artist Way. Um mm-hmm. so it was actually recon- recommended to me by an artist friend. Um so one of the things I really appreciate about this book, it kind of actually talks about how to recover from like creative burnouts. Um, and you would think it's like for traditional artists, like people paint, painting or things like that. And it's like, how does this apply to me? Um, no, that's, that's actually not the the point of the book. The, it actually applies to everyone. So it applies to like lawyers, it applies to, if you're a founder, it applies mm-hmm. to if you're a VP of marketing, right? Um, and one of the things they say is there's, you know, there's two types of brains we use. There's logical brain and there's creative brain and logical brain is, you know, you have to have any machine. And I put a quarter in and I get something in return, right? So it's like very process. I, I do this and I get this, right? And we take that approach a lot of times in our life. We say like, I'm going to do this and I want to get this, right? Mm-hmm. And 
creative brain is, you know, uh, you see a Jaguar driving a car, pulling up to a Burger King, and it's ordering a bunch of hojicha lattes, right? <laughs> and what that is, creative brain is it's randomness, right? And so as human beings, we're always trying to like capture and systemize things. But as soon as you start to systemize things, then you basically kill creativity. So then there's this question of like, how do you create creativity? And there's a lot of like false thinking. It's like, you know, like I have to like do drugs out in the woods and I'll magically might help. <laughs> great help. And it's like, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, there's, you get something from that. Right. But what she talks about is actually creative thinking is actually a process. And there's tools that you can do to facilitate creative process. And she actually quotes Johnny Ives. And Johnny Ives says, like, whenever we go, we create creative processes at Apple, but we can't guarantee that it's going to produce a good design. We can only increase the hit rate or probably that it will. And so some of the tools that she talks about, for example, is this exercise called morning pages. So you write three pages every yeah. morning. Doesn't matter what it is, it could be blah, 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 but you write three pages of that. You do this thing called the artist date every week. An artist date is, you know, two, three hours of your own time. No one can go come with you. And you do something that you wouldn't normally do. Maybe you go to the botanical gardens by yourself. Maybe you go take a class. Maybe you uh, go cook some uh, oxtail soup. I don't, I don't know. What, what, something that you wouldn't normally do. And what you're doing there is on the pages, you're kind of getting your thoughts out. And the first page is usually just obvious things that are top of mind. And as you force yourself to write more, you might be like, fuck this. And this is whatever. But then you start to kind of get into like actual creative thinking as you're just forcing yourself to write. The dates are allowing you to be in a situation that you wouldn't normally be, which fires different neural pathways. And just going through those processes as well, like other exercises that you start to do actually allows you to start to think, think more creatively about things. And then you start to kind of notice it showing up in your work. So like I start to notice like, oh, I'm actually more creative in terms of how I'm approaching problems or I'm more like freeform thinking in terms of it. And it shows up in non-obvious ways, right? Um, and so I think it's a really important discipline that's really under invested because there's such a overemphasis on like logical thinking especially like um as you know founders is like we're we we need to get we want to get guaranteed result yeah. that we oftentimes like miss that we're actually need to be very creative individuals and so we can foster that creative thinking it can actually allow us to get to better decisions as founders too i love that and i think this is probably the fifth time i've been I've heard of the morning pages in the last couple of weeks. So this is probably <laughs> a signal to start doing that. It's a sign from the universe. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also reach reach me on david at apexgrowth.co. Uh, we obviously have a website too, apexgrowth.co as well too. They can go learn more about it as well too. Um, and uh, we will be launching actually a course later this year uh, called Apex Ed. Uh, that's kind of talking about a lot of the soft skills that we talked about um, in addition to like some of the tactical advice. Um, so trying to basically teach people to fish on their own and learn some of the stuff that we charge people $200,000 a month for <laughs> and back packaging up for them to be able to learn on their, on their own. I love that. We're, we'll make sure to link to all that. And David, thanks so much for the time. We, we appreciate you sharing all your learnings with us. Yeah, thanks, David. Appreciate the time.